Um, but before I talk about developing optimizations, I'm going to talk a little bit about optimizing the developer, uh, because I think that that's, uh, that's a, ends up being a pretty big deal, especially for this kind of, kind of work, is uh, optimizing your own productivity. So two words, automate everything. Automate your automation. Like, you can cue all the jokes about, I've put some automation in your automation or, or whatever. It's, but, but yes, do that. Um, it's a really underappreciated and often procrastinated part of, of developer work is, you know, I do this thing a thousand times. I could probably write a script to do this, but I'll, just, I'll, I'll do that later. Like, like, like no, do it now. Um, there was a, a fairly famous X, XKCD comic about sort of, it, it's kind of almost the, the Amdahl's Law kind of analysis of how to optimize your workflow. Um, the big factor in productivity of this kind of work is how many times you can do the edit, compile, run your test suite, run your benchmark, debug, whatever, how many times you can go through that cycle in a day. So the thing that the part of the story that this comic doesn't tell is, all right, so say you have two tasks, two computational tasks that are going to take five minutes each. And it takes five seconds to, to start them. It doesn't seem like there's very much benefit to automating that. But here's what's going to happen. You're going to start the first task, and then you're going to go do something else, because you're not going to sit there and stare at the screen for five minutes. You're going to go be busy reading web comics. And you're going to forget that task was running, and you're going to come back 10 minutes later instead of five minutes later. And so now you've lost that five minutes when you could have started the other task and had it already be done. And in a scenario like this, if you do that twice in a day, that's a whole cycle of edit, compile, benchmark that you've lost in your day. And that, that could be a substantial amount of your productivity for that day. Not to knock reading web comics. So the first thing to script is your whole build and install process, like everything. And you, what, what I have found extremely helpful is configure that script so that it installs each build in its own place, so that an hour later, after you've made 100 more changes, you can just go back and look at that build and compare your results. Um, what I, the way that I have it set up is I can tell it a directory name to, to where it's going to build and install to, kind of down inside my source tree. Uh, I do all um, out of source tree builds. Um, from some of my other scripting that I'll, I'll talk about later, it actually installs it in a directory named after the SHA of the git commit. So it's really, really easy to say, oh, that installation is this exact commit. Um, so uh, make a wrapper script that sets up all the environment variables to run a particular build of Mesa and then run whatever application you actually care about. I think basically everyone has some flavor of this. Uh, it's really important to have it be easy to point it at any build, especially if you end up with, you know, a hundred builds sitting on your disk, like I want that specific SHA from two days ago. Um, and then you want a script that wraps running whatever your test or benchmark suite or whatever is and uh, combines that with scraping all the results out of it. And again, what my script does, um, for example, when I'm running ShaderDB, I don't know how readable that is at the bottom, is it creates a separate result file that combines a particular platform name that, I'm, that I uh, am gathering results for with the SHA of the Mesa commit. So I can really easily just go back and say, all right, what was the difference on this platform between any two commits in, in my branch? So where all this sort of comes together is the last script, which is the script that figures out what the current top commit is in your, in your uh, source tree and then runs all the others. So it does the build, installs the build in something named after that SHA, runs the test suite and generates a bunch of result files named with platforms and SHAs. So now you can combine that with your new best friend, git rebase-x, 
which will run a particular command after every single commit in your tree. So you've been working on a whole bunch of optimizations all day. You have 20 commits setting around. All right, I want to collect benchmark results for it. Get rebase-x, rebase which is harder to say than it seems like it should be. Um, start that running and like go home for the night. And when you get back in the morning, you can look at all your results unless one of your builds failed along the way and then you're really sad. Not that that's ever happened to me almost every day. Um, but then that's also kind of another fringe benefit of it is if you've got a branch that has 40 commits, right? it's good to know it actually builds at every single one of those commits. Because at some point, someone is going to do a bisect that's going to hit the middle of your 40 commit stream. And when they hit that and it fails to build, they're going to shake an angry fist at you because it's going to you know, throw off their, their whole bisect process and cause them problems. So uh, the other thing is, if you're doing a lot of this, especially if you're doing a lot of shader DB runs or doing similar things with, with Vulkan using uh, fossils, get a second machine. Like If you're going to run you know, 15 commits of doing a whole bunch of shader DB running on your personal on you know, the machine that you're actively using, like that's going to bog everything down and make it super irritating. And yeah, that's going to run for an hour. And during that hour, like it's hard to do very much else on your machine. Um, it turns out ShaderDB especially is like the most embarrassingly parallel problem I may have ever seen. And it so benefits from just as many cores as you can throw at it, even if they're fairly low clock speed cores. Uh, there have been a few uh, YouTube videos and, and articles on the web over the last maybe six or eight months from various people, including uh, Phil of uh, Phil's computer lab, about getting older like Ivy Bridge Xeons that have 10 cores and 20 threads and being able to build like less than $200 machines that have you know 32 gigs of RAM and a giant pile of cores, and that would just scream through shader DB runs, and then you can do whatever you want while it's off, doing its own thing, sitting in a corner. All right, so once you've got some idea of a workflow, where do you begin? Well, pick some application that you care about. You get bonus points if it's some application that is new and that no one else has analyzed. But I, I'm not kidding when I say just pick anything. Um, once you've picked a thing that you care about for whatever your metric of I care about it is, whether it's a game you like or a benchmark that people nag you about or whatever, uh, scrape the shaders from it, uh, which is really easy to do for GL. It's not, I, th I think the process is similar for uh, Vulkan, but I'm not, I haven't gone through that whole workflow very much yet, so I, I don't know that much about it. Uh, so if you run it with that environment variable set, it'll dump all the shaders that the application sends into the driver into a directory. You get a whole bunch of shaders with um, numbered name, you know, 36.shader test, et, et cetera. Um, and then just look through that directory and find the largest one is, is usually the good place to start because that probably has the most stuff. Sometimes that fails. There's a lot of apps where they basically have an Uber shader that's controlled by 247 different pound defines. So all the shader tests will be, you know, half a megabyte. And it's just there's a pile of different hash defines at the beginning that control what it actually does. So it, that, that can trick you. But it's usually, it's usually a reasonable thing to, to try first. And then what I do is uh, run it using the, um, the run command in ShaderDB with Intel debug set to all the shader stages or all the shader stages that you care about. Um, which may be a subset that just names out, you know, vertex, both the tessellation shaders, geometry, fragment, and compute, just all of them. Um, and then just look at the results. Um, 
You can also use the environment variable, uh, all caps, NUR underscore print equals true. Um, that does a little bit different uh, because what that does is that dumps NUR through each stage of all of the optimization and lowering paths. So you get a lot of information that maybe isn't interesting during the initial analysis, but later on while you're developing your optimization pass and you notice like, okay, I looked at this shader, it has this pattern, I implemented a thing that should detect that and change it to something else, it's not happening, what the heck. Looking at that output and, and kind of watching how the shader evolves can help you figure out why things aren't triggering the way that you think that they should. Um, the other catch about uh, NER print equals true is that only works in debug builds, and when you're doing a lot of shader DB runs, don't, don't use debug builds. <laughs> you want the most optimized release build you can do, like March equals native, dash 099, you know, whatever, like do all the things because it, it is going to grind for a while. Um, and I usually start by looking at NUR just because it's, it's quite a bit easier to read and scheduling that happens in backends kind of makes it harder to follow the, the flow of programs. <clears throat> but sometimes looking at the GPU assembly can help find optimizations to do where if you you know, if you know that your GPU has some interesting instruction and it's not being generated for a shader, you might want to try to, to uh, develop a NUR pass that will kind of massage uh, the NUR around so that it's in a form a little bit more friendly to being able to generate that, that kind of instruction. Um, it kind of goes along with, with Neil's talk about wanting to, you know, rearrange things so that the... Um, the type conversions are in the right places relative to uh, uh, arithmetic operations so that the back end could then detect them and generate the right kind of, of math instructions, for example. So what are you looking for? I mean, just kind of skim through the shader and look for stuff that looks weird. Like the, the weird things that you see might not necessarily be places for optimization, but looking at how data is flowing through and instructions are consuming them and what sorts of math is happening um, can lead to a lot of, of different kinds of uh, revelations and can, can help you find optimizations to do. A lot of it is looking for semi-redundant kinds of operations where you see values that are consumed in really similar kind of parallel bits of math um, one common one that I ran into a while ago was places where you, the shader would do X minus Y and then do a comparison like X greater than Y, and it turned out that, especially for uh, Intel GPUs, it was better to just do that subtract and then do a comparison with zero because that could get folded into a single instruction. Um, and a lot of those kinds of optimizations are either looking to take advantage of special instructions or rearrange things to make CSE more effective. Uh, I also look a lot for different kinds of flow control that could become selects or selects that could become different kinds of logic operations. Uh, there's a lot of different kind of algebra that you can do with that to, to eliminate operations. And anytime you see a lot of B to F or B to I, man, you're probably going to hit a gold mine. Uh, the, the HLSL compiler, the way that it handles booleans, especially for some of the older shader models, but even like shader model five, man, it generates some really weird stuff. And it's like, no, just, just knock all of that off and just treat them as booleans for crying out loud. Uh, you, you would be amazed at the, at the stuff that you see there. So when you start looking, what, what are you likely to find? Like, I'm not kidding. You, okay, so the lowest hanging fruit is the stuff that's just laying on the ground, and there's lots of it. Um, it's, it's almost to the point, I have a little bit of an advantage because now I've been doing this for quite a while, but I practically can't look at the NUR that comes out of a shader and not see something that could be improved. Like, the improvements or the changes might not make a practical difference, but 
I can at least see like, oh, that looks weird. You could do that a different way. I'll try that. And maybe nothing comes of it, or you know, maybe it ends up being a huge jackpot. Um, so for example, earlier I had um, in, shown in one of the command lines using this uh, a shader from Yo Frankie, which I had literally picked at random out of the public ShaderDB repository. And I skimmed through it, and I didn't see anything huge and weird. But there was still something in there that was, that, that was a potential for an optimization. Um, so you have a little bit of math. You have a, a multiply with a saturate modifier on it. With, so that's going to restrict the range to 0 to 1. And then you square that and saturate it again. But if the two sources are already on the range 0 to 1, like the result is 2. So that saturate is entirely redundant. Now, it seems, it, it seems pretty unlikely that this is going to lead to much, but I figured it was, it was worth trying anyway. And it kind of illustrated my point of, man, everywhere you look, there's something. Um, so we can implement a simple fix. Most optimizations in this class are going to be in opt-algebraic. Um, and even some of the ones that maybe seem better to have their own pass, you can probably make work and, and do reasonably well in, in opt-algebraic. Uh, so for this one, I just implemented a thing where it's the, the first line is a description of the pattern that we saw. And it's a little bit more general than what's in the actual Yo Frankie shader, where it's if you have any two sources to the multiply, they, they don't necessarily have to be the same that are, that are saturated. Um, and then the replacement just strips the other uh, saturate off. Um, more complicated kinds of operations generally will require their own pass. Um, the, uh, the opt uh, comparison partial redundancy elimination pass was added to catch cases where a shader had both a, a comparison of two variables and a subtraction of those two variables, because you could just delete the, the one comparison. Um, usually, if you find a case where you have some bit of, you have some pattern that's maybe a little bit more complicated than a simple replace this tree with that tree, um, there's probably already an optimization path that's kind of similar to that. And you can either copy and modify that optimization pass or just enhance the existing pass to, to do a little bit more. Uh, it's kind of a judgment call on, on each case, which is, which is going to be better. Um, I think most of the ones that, that I've implemented recently ha have all been cases of, of just implement a new pass, but I didn't really do any of them from scratch because there's so many optimizations already in NUR that do a whole bunch of different kinds of massaging of the code that there's probably something that's you know, at least if you look at it far enough and turn it on its side, is, you know, doing a similar kind of a thing. So once you've implemented your optimization, uh, you want to analyze your results. And this is where uh, doing the, the git rebase-x comes into play. So when I usually do it, I'll do a rebase on origin master caret so that it, the way that rebase dash x uh, inserts the execute commands is it does it after each commit. And you want to do one run before any of your changes. So what this will do is make it so the rebase is one thing from master and all of your changes, so you'll get an execute after that first thing from master and then after each of your own changes. So you effectively get a before and then each step of after. Uh, and then when it's done, compare your results. Um, using there's a report.py for Intel, and I think that there's another script for, for doing this on the, on the Radeon drivers that uh, operates kind of similarly. Uh, 
so my rebase shader DB uh, operates a little bit differently than I think the way most of the other people work. Um, because I actually run and collect results for every uh, Intel platform ever. Because uh, one thing that happens fairly on a fairly regular basis is some optimization might be really helpful on a modern part, but on a part from six years ago, it's just a disaster because older parts tend to not have certain cool instructions or they have additional limitations or or whatever. Uh, so it's good to catch, like, all right, I may have done something great on the latest platform, but I, I don't want to ruin some some other platform. Like, it's, you know, d do no harm kind of a thing. Um, so that rebase script uh, creates a results file that have the platform name embedded in it and then also the SHA embedded in it. And the, the number the, the two-digit number in the in the middle is uh, the number of steps since master, so that uh, like ls-l will give sort of a, a nice natural sorting of things. Um, and I end up using uh, ls-ltc a lot too to see how see the the, the timeline of uh, where things were generated. Uh, so this will produce. Uh, an output, and this, these are the results from, from that, that little trivial change that, that I had shown earlier. Um, fun fact, the shaders that were helped by this weren't even the one that we saw the weird pattern in. Like the Yo Frankie shader was modified, uh, and, and we'll look at that kind of towards the end. I'll, I'll kind of show how I use some of the tools. Uh, but the shaders that were actually helped was a, a couple of shaders that were part of the, uh, the Unreal Engine tech demos. Um, so when you look at this output, there's a couple of important things to, to look at and to consider. Um, one is the min and max on the helped, on the helped and hurt stats. Um, that can be especially important uh, if you have a case where you have, oh, I don't know. So you might have a case where you have an optimization that helps a whole bunch of shaders by three instructions, and on average, the optimization is a help, but it hurts a much smaller handful of shaders by 50 instructions. Like, well, maybe that's not actually great, and you should go and look at those hurt shaders and say, okay, why, why were these shaders hurt so much? Uh, so I'd usually look at the, the min and max uh, helped and hurt shaders. Uh, look at the um, mean versus the median. This is especially interesting. I found in cases where um, the mean is significantly higher than the median, uh, that indicates that there are a few outliers that are significantly affecting the mean. So if you have, I don't know, 500 shaders that are affected by one instruction and five shaders that are affected by 100 instructions, that's going to significantly skew your mean, but the median is still just going to be one, right? And that's actually a more accurate representation of the, the likely change, but it points out, hey, there's, there's some weirdos, and maybe you should go look at those weirdos and find out what's going on there. Um, in the hurt cases, it usually means there's some additional optimization work to do, and sometimes in the helped cases, it means you have a bug and you've completely broken those shaders that were helped by a big pile of instructions because you did something that led to half the shader just being deleted when it should not have been. Uh, I've, I've had that happen a few times. Um, and then the other thing, as is the case on this, is the, in the very top line, there's, it shows the total instructions in shared programs. So that's the total effect across the whole database, including programs that weren't affected. What's, what is the percentage? The very last thing is, what, what is the percentage of instructions changed? And when that shows up, the l less than 0.01%, I'm usually probably going to give up on an optimization. Like, if, it, if you don't actually get any, any a score on the board, like, meh, 
it's, it's probably not, not worth the effort at, at that point. There's a couple exceptions to that. Um, the main one is cases where I'll have a, a commit fairly early in the series that is going to sort of massage some patterns around to make optimizations later in the series more effective. I've had quite a few of that where there'll be three or four commits that on their own basically do nothing, but they make it so that the, the, the real, the big money patch either doesn't have regressions or has even more benefit. I think I actually covered a lot of this already. Uh, yeah, so the other thing to look at in outliers, which wasn't shown in that output because it only showed the change statistics, uh, um, shaders that end up with a lot of spills and fills changed are, are worth looking at. Uh, shaders that have the number of loops changed, which is really, really uncommon, those are absolutely worth looking at, especially at this point. If you've managed to do something that gets more loop unrolling, I'd be very suspicious <laughs> uh, that, that maybe that, that shader is broken. Um, and sort of on the flip side, if you're reviewing patches that, you know, if you're reviewing an MR that has optimizations like this and they have embedded shader DB results, and there's looking at those statistics, if you can see that there's some weird outliers if the submitter hasn't mentioned anything about that in their commit message or maybe the, the cover letter, ask. Ask if they looked. And, uh, you know, a lot of people who are new to projects are kind of nervous and self-conscious about providing review feedback to especially more senior people. Uh, but, but this is the kind of review feedback that, like, if you have a pulse, you are qualified to provide this kind of review feedback. Like you can ask someone, did you do your homework? <laughs> like that is, that is absolutely okay and is valuable because maybe they forgot or maybe they did and just didn't say anything about it and they'll give you a response and you'll learn something. Um, so the other thing here is the uh, try before and after script that I have uh, gathers data about a particular shader stage before and after, uh, basically across two different uh, results. And the way I constructed that script, all, all this stuff kind of ends up tying together, is it looks at the result file and it extracts from that the platform name and the git SHA. So now it can go run shaderDB on the single selected um, shader for the platform on each of those commits and generate separate output files that you can then look at. And this is part of the reason why keeping every single build and having them in a uh, predictable uh, installation directory is extremely valuable because then you can go back and do this, this kind of analysis. So if git rebase-x is your best friend, diff side-by-side -side is who you hang out with when he's out of town for some reason. Uh, so you can take the, the, the way that the previous script operates is it creates a file in slash temp called before.txt and one called after.txt, and you can just diff those side-by-side -side and just scan through them and look for any changes between them. The one kind of irritating aspect of that is if you have something that has a thousand NUR instructions and something happens that deletes a very early instruction, like makes there be a constant that's not used anymore, so now the thing that was SSA value 2 is deleted and it's something else and all your SSA values have been renumbered, it'll say, look, the two shaders are both completely different in every possible way. When it's like, no, later on there was one instruction that changed. It just looks different. Um, so on procrastinating automating things, I don't think it would be too hard to write a script where you could give it one of these output files and say, any SSA value above a certain number, add this number to its value. And then you could sort of 
rearrange those SSA values so that the things would, uh, would match up better. I've just kind of gotten efficient at sort of being able to eyeball it as they're mostly side by side and kind of try to spot changes, but you know, one of these days. Um, so the other thing that I've, that I've found while doing this is while you're looking, as you look more and more closely at the neuro output of these shaders, you're gonna find more weird stuff. Like you found one weird thing, and then that's just gonna lead to more weird things. Have a text file somewhere where you keep notes of that, of I saw this pattern, and the important part that I didn't learn until <laughs> quite a ways into this is I found this weird pattern in this shader, <laughs> So you can go back and find it later. I have a whole bunch of them that are, there's this weird neuro pattern. Oh, I have no idea where that was. And you know, once the code base has changed by six months, that weird pattern might not get generated anymore because some work that you did or some work that someone else did makes that not happen. Um, but, but still, keeping, keeping those notes and remembering like, oh, hey, here's all this other weird stuff to come back to uh, is exceptionally valuable. So one, invariably, there will be cases where you help a whole bunch of shaders and there's a big pile of regressions. Um, these most, these are generally two categories that I've found are most common of these. Uh, the first category is cases where you do an algebraic optimization and because you rearrange part of a tree, um, CSE gets, can't, can't be as effective uh, because some sub-expression of the tree that you're rearranging was also used, and so now you end up sort of, ha you've created a partial redundancy. Uh, sometimes using the is used once predicate can help with that. You can decorate and say, only do this optimization if this part of the tree is only used once. So. If this, is, if this is the only user of this sub-expression, go ahead and do this, this rewrite, otherwise don't. Uh, but it can be a little tricky to, to figure out when that's effective. You just kind of have to look at the output of the Hertz shaders and, and see what happens. Um, some of the other predicates, like uh, is not fmol, is f sign, and there's, there's a handful of others can, can also help, uh, but it's, it's kind of more art than science. It takes a lot of looking at the diffs of the shaders that you've hurt and trying to figure out what, why why it went wrong. Uh, other things that, that cause hurts uh, is uh, changes that, that only affect subsets of platforms because the platform doesn't have an instruction or it has other constraints. Uh, I ran into a lot of cases um, on the, the vertex processing stage on older Intel GPUs, our, our back end is really terrible at handling constants on those platforms. So optimizations that create a bunch more constants sometimes are kind of a disaster on those platforms. Uh, so I've done a, a bit of work to, to add predicates and things to just like, no, just like don't even do this whole optimization pass on this platform. It, it, it should be better, but it's just not. Um, and you know, a bunch of other kinds of little little platform limit limitations. Um, rearranging, especially on Intel GPUs, because of how our FMA instruction works and all of all of the the three source instruction works, uh, it can be really sensitive to how things get rearranged and and where constants are. So there's 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 a lot of of black magic in there. Um, so when you encounter these these kinds of regressions, uh, a lot of there's generally three common remedies: rework some existing algebraic optimization to continue to work with a new input pattern, because maybe you've just rearranged something and now an old optimization can't see that this bigger picture is still something that it recognizes. So you have to kind of rework some of those patterns. You may just have to add some more optim some more algebraic optimizations to further optimize things or, or do additional rearrangings to make your new optimization more effective. 
Or you might just need to improve how your back end selects instructions for a given tree pattern. Uh, there's been an awful lot of that too. Um, but you have to be careful with this because it's really, really easy to get stuck in, I just need to fix one more thing and it'll be great. Like it's, uh, it's you know, the, the old, the old, old joke about the, the programmer who died in the shower. Like everyone knows this, right? You read the shampoo bottle that said lather, rinse, repeat, and he got stuck in an infinite loop. Right. Um, you know, so, so either that or you can, you can start to feel like the old woman who swallowed a fly where it's just a fix on a fix on a fix on a fix. And at some point, you just have to say, all right, this, this is not going to go anywhere and abandon it. And, and maybe just abandon it temporarily. Um, there have been a bunch of cases where a set of optimizations were almost great, but there was a problem with them, and then later some other set of optimizations got implemented that made those other ones work. Uh, the, 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 the flip can also happen. If you have a branch sitting around for a long time, someone else might come along to implement some optimizations that make those things irrelevant. So it's kind of, it, it's kind of uh, double-edged. Um, but for as many patches as I've landed in OptAlgebraic, uh, I've probably thrown away twice as many, or at least have them on you know, branches marked experimental you know, somewhere in my, in my Git repository. So when you're getting ready to submit, I'll usually do a git rebase-x rebase again, just to invariably while you're doing this, master will have moved, stuff has changed, maybe that's affected your results. Recollect up all your results and, and you know, update all your commit messages to include your results. Um, like I mentioned before, this also ensures that intermediate steps don't break the build because the merge request pipeline only checks the tip, and if you've got a, a long series, you don't want to have an intermediate uh, build break that won't, that won't be detected by the, the pipeline. Um, if you haven't changed anything and you still have a set of result files sitting around, I have another script called summarize results where you give it a, a, sh a range of SHAs and it trolls through all, all the... Um, all the result files in that range and, and dumps out all the, all the results in a, in a pretty format. Uh, it's also good to do, uh, to run just report.py on the, the before and the very last patch in your series to say, here's the change across the entire series and put that in the, in the cover letter. Uh, sometimes that gives a better image of, you know, the, the big picture than, than trying to, you know, infer it from a whole bunch of individual results. So one idea that I had uh, that kind of goes back to temporarily abandoning things that aren't working out, uh, on Monday when I started preparing for this, I, I had an idea. So it's not fully thought out yet, and, and it, it may be nothing, um, for how to enhance opt algebraic to, to let it be. Let it do some other kinds of optimizations that are currently, I think, would currently require doing a separate pass. So one of the one of the biggest sources of regressions is places where you create a partial redundancy by blocking CSE. Um, it seems like we ought to be able to detect those cases where the partial redundancy already exists and invert it to make CSE more effective. So what we want to be able to say is, have this pattern, replace it with this pattern, but only if this other thing also exists, where this other thing is probably a sub-expression in the replacement pattern. Um, so this could get done as a, a late optimization outside of the, the main optimization loop to uh, repair damage caused by other optimizations. So as a concrete example of that, uh, a while ago, I added an optimization that replaced sequences like 1 minus F sat with F sat of 1 minus A. Uh, because what I had observed is there were a bunch of places where 
especially around flow control, but, but not always, you would, we would end up with actual FSAT instructions. Um, and since, those two va since the values generated by both of those are the same, it makes sense to be able to fold in that FSAT with the subtraction and get it for free instead of having a separate instruction. And I did that, and it helped a whole bunch of shaders. Um, but along the way, uh, when I originally implemented it, it hurt a crap ton. Like it, 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 I think it hurt as many or more shaders than it helped. But it was, it was still really big numbers on both. So I dug into it and found, oh, okay, so it's places where it's breaking CSE. It's places where because some of the operands are multiplies, it's making it so that we can't get FMAs and a whole bunch of other things. So added a big, I mean, there is a restriction decoration on almost every piece of this source pattern, which is kind of awful. Um, but it was needed to, to prevent regressions. So what if we could remove some of that con conditioning and later on just fix up the things that were changed that hurt? So if we could just do something like, all right, well, let's, let's do the inverse thing. Right? Let's, if I have this thing that looks like F sat of 1 minus A, let's replace that with you know, 1 minus F sat, but only if the F sat thing already exists, already also exists. So we're just going to create an opportunity for CSE. Uh, there's a bunch of problems with this. I'm really not sure how that extra search would get implemented, uh, just because of the way that opt algebraic works. It examines instructions and then has a very sophisticated piece of machinery for finding the patterns that match the piece of instructions that you're looking at. And instead, you need to go backwards. You need to say, I have this pattern. Who, who here is my friend? And that, that I think, is, is it's a different kind of a problem. And it's not immediately obvious how that would, how that would be implemented. Um, but with something like this, I mean, there's a whole bunch of optimizations that got put on the back shelf because they caused problems that weren't trivially fixable. And so maybe this would make them you know, make those viable optimizations. Maybe not, right? But it's, it's why it's valuable to, when you have branches that don't pan out, keep them somewhere. Like, give, give it a, a good descriptive name, mark it experimental. I think all, mines are call, all mine are called, you know, experiment slash, you know, descriptive name, and they still live out in my Git tree, and someday, like someone can come back, you know, maybe me, maybe someone else can come back and revisit them and see, hey, is this is this viable now? Um, so I put up a couple of Git trees. Uh, the first one has all of the scripts that I use for building Mesa and for doing the rebases and for all that. The second one has the scripts that I added to to Shader DB for uh, doing the the big blocks of runs and for uh, producing the, the big group uh, result outputs and for doing the, the comparisons of b before and after. They're really tied to the particular directory structure that I use and how I have the, the rest of the stuff in my machine set up. So they're probably not directly useful, but uh, they probably would provide a good starting point for people wanting to do this kind of work and, and do some other optim um, automation. You don't necessarily, you know, you don't have to start from scratch. Like we've all done a whole bunch of this stuff before, uh, so we can we can share. All right. Any any questions or comments? <laughs> I got yelled at for not having a mic. <laughs> Find a mic. <laughs> I was going to say report pi has been generalized. It works on other drivers now. Oh, okay. And uh, I also have a merge request outstanding that adds an option. And I also had a, I have a merge request that adds an option to filter on shader stage, which I find kind of useful because, oh. you know, sometimes optimizations that help patterns common in fragment shaders tend to overall help a lot more. Right. For example. Yeah, yeah. and and I have encountered a lot of cases where things that maybe help in one shader stage 
cause problems in, in other shader stages. That's, that's really interesting. I like that idea. Uh, I just, uh, you mentioned that the uh, shaders, you might oh, sorry, back. yeah, you, should, you mentioned that um, Uber shaders could cause a problem with the if-death stuff. Uh, did you consider well, so uh, the, the running is, it through the preprocessor so first? So, so the problem with it is, isn't so much that they, that they cause a problem with, with running ShaderDB, it's that when you have a, uh, a directory dump, of, of shaders and you want to try to find, you, you might have, so, so off a typical app, you might have a directory dump that has 200 shaders in it and you want to find some place to start. Where I usually like to start is which, which, which one of those files is the biggest, right? Because that shader probably has the most stuff in it and, you know, making optimizations in it is most likely to, you know, have the most tangible benefit. Um, the thing about Uber shaders that screws you up is then you look at it and all of the files are within 20 bytes of each other. And so it's not, the file size isn't giving you any information because every file is basically the same file. And right. So, but if you dump the, the pre-processed shader before, uh, rather than the uh, shader source string, that would make yeah. that quicker, I guess. Yeah. I mean, kind of the flip side of that is that then it's harder to look at at the shader source and try to figure out semantically what were they trying to do and why did they end up with this madness in in NUR. Dump both. Um, but that's that still could be that still could be. I mean you could just I mean you could it would probably be easy enough to make some kind of automation that would just run it through like the C preprocessor or through some some sed filters to to to, to be able to do that and maybe get uh, a better idea of, of the the real weight of a shader. Yeah. Well, but that, or you, that you could also just run like run it through shader DB, right? And then for right. the thing that has the largest number of instructions. Yep. Yep. Any other questions? Nope. One more. I think that that side of the class must be asleep. So, um, you mentioned looking at the largest shader. Do you have any idea how this holds to looking for the shader with most time spent? Yeah, so that's a different kettle of fish uh, there. Uh, and it's, if Mark Jaynes were here, he would he would have a talk about that because uh, he's been he's been working on a tool for quite a while that that helps find, you know, what's what's the, the draw call in a frame that uses the most time uh, and then being able to look at, well, what are the shaders in that? I, I, but, it, but that ends up being, that that's a different sort of analysis that's more accurate but is a bunch more work and requires a bunch more tooling to do, whereas just like I mean, I can do ls dash l and figure out which one's the biggest pretty pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think what's worth mentioning is that API trace, which I think Mark Stowe is actually based off, has, mm -hmm. has an option to not only figure out the most expensive draw calls, but also the most expensive shaders of the whole trace. Right. So I, if you're doing like a, a capturing shaders, like it's not entirely diff different efforts to make a trace of a game. Yeah. I mean, it's of course a bunch bigger size, but. I mean, so, so part of the problem is that, I mean, it is, but it isn't, right? Because that place where the most expensive shader in an app is might not, you might not be able to get to that until level 47, the end boss. <laughs> and that, that might be a substantial amount of effort, but, but yeah, definitely like, Usually, pretty early in any app or game, you can find some stuff that's expensive and and start searching there. That that is another completely valid place to start looking. A, a lot of the shaders that I've looked at, just because there's so much fruit laying on the ground, are ones that we already have dumps for that just no one has looked at, and I don't even have any of those apps, so I can just like, oh, th I'll pick this one today, see see what it has, and then a lot of it. Kind of once you start tugging on that thread, and you look at you look at some of the outliers from the first optimization that you've done. While you're looking at why did this shader change in the way it did, you'll see something else in that of 
why, 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 why is that? <laughs> Add that to your notes and come back to it. <laughs> so that, that's, yeah, you just need a place to start, you know, tugging on the, the thread. Anyone else? All right, thanks.